are going to be looking at the first woman in the Bible who's in search of wisdom, the one known as the mother of all living, Eve. Wisdom is an important concept that the Bible upholds as as the ideal for human achievement, that, that we would cultivate wisdom. And wisdom answers questions or provides a way of thinking about some of the deepest questions that humans think about. Who am I? And what am I to do in this world? And how am I to do it? Where am I gonna find the resources to do the thing that God's called me to do because of who he made me to be? And so this morning, as we as we consider Eve, the first woman who searched for this wisdom, we're going to discover that true wisdom always involves relying on God for answers to these questions. Last week, while you all were doing missions conference, I had an interesting experience. I had to drive all the way across town to a place called, I think, Sherwood Oaks, Sherman Oaks? I can't remember now. It was, it was far away. It took me an hour and a half to get there and it took me two and a half hours to get home in traffic. And I went there on Thursday and Friday. I was re- recording the audiobook for my new book that's coming out on being God's image. And because I'd never been there before, obviously, I used a GPS, and a GPS is an amazing invention. I remember back before we had these things, and we had an envelope by our phone, and it had a bunch of papers stuffed into it, which were the scribbles that we made when we were on the phone with someone trying to get instructions to how to get to their place, and we would write them all down, you know, turn left on this street, turn right on that street, whatever, and we'd write them all down, and then we'd take them with us in the car, and we would navigate, and and then we'd stick them in that envelope so we didn't have to call them again the next time to figure out where to go. I remember that, but now, we have a GPS. And when I got into the car on my way to come home the first uh, evening, Thursday evening, it told me it was gonna take two hours and seven minutes to get back to La Mirada, which is a long time. Now, the cool thing about GPS is, is that they're tracking not just how to get from point A to point B, but what the current traffic conditions are that tell you how long and what's the best route to take. Now, not having been all the way there and all the way back before, it wouldn't have done me any good to rely on my own sense of direction or on my own intuition about, you know, boy, this freeway's sure crowded. I should just get off at the next exit and see if I can find a shorter route. Surely it would be faster to get back to La Mirada if I just took side streets the whole way. No, the GPS knows the fastest way. It's tracking how fast cars are going and it will tell me uh, the, the best way. And, if, and several times as I was driving, it would say, you can shave off six minutes if you go this way, six minutes faster, and, you know, accept. And I would click accept and it would take me off the freeway and I'd go through some neighborhood and then I'd get back on again. And I never would have found that by myself. I never would have known which of those exits would save me time and which ones would add to my time. It kept telling me, ooh, this one is six minutes slower. Not taking that one. I'm taking the ones that make it go faster. Wisdom is knowing where to look for the answers. And the GPS was the right place to look on my long commute. When we trust our eyes and and our own judgment for, for where to find, what to do, where to go, we are bound to get into a situation in which things don't turn out well. When we rely on our own wisdom, when we try to find our wisdom outside of God um, versus looking to God for our limits, looking to God for what the right thing is to do. So we we heard from Genesis chapter one, sorry, chapter three, two and three this morning, a, a bit from two and a bit from three. And what we heard in those passages is part of God's answer to the first question, who we are, and part of what we heard is the parameters within which we can exercise that identity. So God is not shutting down human dignity or human agency or human creativity. He's just saying, this is the lane in which you are to exercise it. This is the lane that's gonna get you where you want to go. And so this morning, I want, to, I want us to think about how Eve shows us how to look for 
the DPS, not the GPS, but the DPS, the divine positioning system. In Genesis 2, we have the creation of a beautiful garden. God plants a garden, he puts Adam in the garden, and there are two trees in the garden that are notable, that are named. There's the tree of life, and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God wants good things for his children, and so he gives them lots of fruit, he gives them all that they need, all the provision that they need to flourish, but there's this one tree that they're not supposed to eat from, And to me, that tree represents the attempt to find good and evil, to define good and evil outside of God. God says, look to me to know what is good and evil. You can eat from all these other trees and you can walk with me and I will show you what is good. But here's a tree over over here. And if you eat from this tree, it represents your attempt to make sense of life on your own without my guidance, without my authority. So as we think about these two trees, we need to ask the question, what answers has God already provided about human identity and vocation? Because the temptation to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the temptation to find wisdom outside of God. But what wisdom has God already provided? Well, there are two main things I wanna think about together this morning. The first is the Imago Dei, the image of God. And the second is uh, represented by the Hebrew word azer. And both of those are, are found in these early chapters of Genesis. First of all, what does it mean that humans are made as God's image? We're told in Genesis chapter one, verse 27, so God created humankind as his own image. As the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And on this Women's History Month, it's important for us to notice that it's not just men who are the image of God. Men and women together are the image of God. And what does it mean to be the image of God? Well, it's our human identity, but it has implications for the job that we do, for the vocation that we fulfill. And so in verse 26, we're told, let us make humankind as our image, as our likeness, so that they may rule. What does it mean to be God's image? It means to rule as God's representative over the created world. So this is an answer to the question we should be asking about who am I and what, is my, what am I here to do? Genesis 1 already, right off the bat, gives us the answer. I am the image of God and I am appointed to rule. That's part of the answer to the question of who I am. Now, the word image is a slippery one. We think of it in digital ways now, and for many, many centuries, people have talked about the image of God in abstract terms. For example, they say, oh, to be the image of God means we possess greater rationality than the animals. We can think better than they can, or we're more relational, or we're we, we have a moral compass that animals don't have. And so people t- have tried to look for what's the difference between humans and animals, and then we'll call that the image of God. But in this passage, if we pay attention to the word that's used to describe the image, we find that it's something concrete. A tselem is something concrete. It's the same word used to describe an idol that would set, be set up in a temple of another god. And so Yahweh made humans as his image because God wants us here, there, and everywhere as reminders to all creation of his rule. He's in charge, and he's placed us all over the globe as reminders of that. So that's the Imago Dei. What about the Azer? Yahweh, God said in Genesis 2.18, he's speaking here, Uh, about Adam's predicament. He says, it's not good for the human to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This is a famous verse because it's it's the impetus for creating woman in the second creation account in Genesis chapter two. And I I just want to pause here long enough to make a case for what does this word azer, translated helper, actually mean? Because the word azer, 
is not quite the same thing as the English word helper. When you hear the word helper, maybe you're like me and you picture what a servant does for a master or what an employee does for an employer. They come along and help. It's a subservient role. In English, that's the connotation for some of us. But that's not what the Hebrew word azer actually, uh, that it's not the connotation from this Hebrew word. I've looked up all the occurrences of the word azer in Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible. There are about 100 occurrences where it's either a noun or a verb form, and they are used consistently in one of two ways. About half the time, an azer is used to describe God as Israel's helper or however we want to translate this word, azer. The other half of the time, the word is used to describe a military ally. So if you're in trouble and another enemy army is bearing down on you, what you need is not somebody to make you sandwiches or to clean up the mess after you. You need an ally. You need another military unit to come alongside you and fight in the trenches so that you're not overcome. And that is what an azer is in the Bible. Not a single time in the entire Old Testament is the word azer used to describe what a servant does for his master or what, a, what an employee does for an employer. So as we're looking to Genesis for this answer, about who am I and what am I supposed to do in the world, we discover that God doesn't think that the man can or should do all the work himself. He needs somebody alongside him, somebody who can be an ally corresponding to him. God has already told us that he put the man in the garden to work it and to guard it. There's a, there's a cultivating role for the first man, and there's also a defensive role. Now, you could ask, who, what are they guarding against? Well, any kind of intruder. Well, Dr. Imes, are you saying there are other people who might become intruders? I'm not saying one way or the other. We have one intruder in chapter three that I think they should have stopped at the border of the garden or cast out. Just yesterday on Twitter, uh, er early in the morning, I, I got up before church, I checked Twitter, and Beth Moore, who is one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter because she's sassy and she's godly and she's just a whole lot of fun, she said, friends, it's not even 9 a.m. and I have already killed a copperhead. I haven't even laid out my church clothes yet. <laughs> And I thought, what a perfect example. Here's a woman who is killing a snake that has come onto her property. It's an intruder. What better picture do we need of what the first woman ought to have done in the garden? To cultivate it and to guard it. So what parameters has God given? We already talked about the two trees. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Now let's think about Eve. She sees the tree. She hears what the serpent says about it, that it's pleasing to the eye and good for food. The serpent says she's not actually gonna die, that it will make her wise, that she will be like God, knowing good and evil. And who doesn't wanna be like God? God actually made us to be like him. We're made as his image. So the serpent frames the temptation in such a way that draws her in because there's some truth to it. She is like God and she's becoming more like God as she grows in wisdom and the serpent offers her a shortcut hey, just eat from this tree, it's like this magic, it'll get you there faster. Except the problem is, it's outside of God's will for her. God has already made clear that that tree is off limits, and there's no possible way for us to get to wisdom outside of the parameters that God set up. True wisdom is not available to those who seek it apart from God. The consequences are not what Eve imagined. But here's where I think we need to take a second look. Eve has gotten a pretty bad rap in the history of interpretation. 
We like to blame her for our predicament. After all, if she hadn't reached out and taken the fruit and taken a bite and then given it to her husband who was with her, then we wouldn't be in this sorry mess that we are in. We wouldn't be in a broken world. We wouldn't have sin and death and sorrow and pain and all these things. So come on, Eve, what were you thinking? Now, I'm not here to defend her choice. Eve undoubtedly, undeniably made the wrong choice to eat from this tree. The thing is, it's not the end of the story about Eve. The Bible has more to say to us about Eve, and I think we kind of zero in on what she did wrong, and we miss the part where God redeems her story. I love the songs that we sang this morning because they talked about how God meets us in the mess. He meets us in the mess with his grace, and God could have said to Eve, forget you, you have disqualified yourself, you're out. And it's true, he did ask Adam and Eve to leave the garden. He did kick them out. But he doesn't kick them out of his plan. And that's what I want to think about with you this morning. I've been sitting with Eve for a while now, for a few months, and I've been reflecting on what was it that Eve did wrong? Was she too ambitious? Was she too decisive? Was she too bossy? is the whole problem that Eve didn't step back and let the man lead. Is that what this is? If Adam had been leading the way, would we not be in the mess that we're in? So then let's remember what we just talked about. Who did God make Eve to be? He made her as the Imago Dei. And the Imago Dei means her job is to rule over creation. So no, she wasn't being too bossy. She's supposed to be bossy. That's her role. She's the azer. She's the ally corresponding to Adam. She's supposed to come alongside him and help him do the right thing. The problem is not that she was too decisive. I would argue the problem is that Eve was not ambitious or decisive or bossy enough. That's what I think is going on in Genesis. She ought to have been more ambitious. She ought to have been more decisive. She ought to have been more bossy than she was. She failed to subdue the serpent. And that's what the first man and woman were supposed to do. They were supposed to work together, side by side, to rule the earth and subdue it. And that word sub subdue in Hebrew is kabosh, which is where we get the, Hebrew, the English word kabosh. Um, she was supposed to stamp out any intruders to block them from access to God's good garden. So what's God's solution to Eve's failure to carry out her vocation for not being strong enough in this story? Well, after she rebels, all is not lost. She recognizes that she was deceived. She names the enemy of God. If we know where to look, there is great encouragement in Eve's story. Let's take a look. God announced a solution to the unraveling of his creation purposes through Eve's offspring. We heard the passage earlier I will put hostility between you and the woman, God is speaking here to the serpent, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God could have said, Eve, you've dis disqualified yourself, there's no more place for you in my plan. But instead, he takes the very woman who made the wrong choice and he presents her as the vehicle of redemption. It's through Eve that the snake crusher will come. Yes, the consequences of the fall are disastrous for humans. Yes, there will be pain in conception and childbirth. Things are not gonna come easy for Adam and Eve, but the, the union, their union and production of offspring is the very means by which God's purposes for creation will be revealed. The enmity between Eve and the serpent, or hostility, is actually a good 
sign. I, I, I didn't see that until more recently. I thought, oh, this is bad. Look, now there's hostility. No, there should have been a little bit more hostility at the beginning of chapter three. Eve should have said, shut up. No, how dare you try to tempt me to go outside of God's plan? How dare you suggest that God is holding out on me, that there's something that would actually be good for me that God is saying no to? How dare you question the goodness of God? That's how Eve should have responded. She should have had a whole lot more en enmity or hostility. And now, as a consequence to the fall, when God confronts Eve and says, what is this you have done? She says, the serpent deceived me, which he did. And I ate, which she did. She owns her sin. And on the basis of that confession, God announces to her, all right, going forward, you are gonna hate each other's guts. And that's exactly what she should be feeling and, and doing. She should hate and oppose anyone who's setting themselves up in opposition to the good God who created all things. Should she not? So by the end of chapter three, Eve has aligned her purposes with God's. The consequences of the fall do not strip Eve of agency, but rather restore it. Yes, things will be difficult, but as the mother of all living, Eve will also mother the one who will finally defeat the serpent. So I wanna step back and just briefly consider, are there other offspring of Eve who participate in this enmity or hostility? Are there other women in the Bible who get it, who understand they, they need to oppose anything that sets itself up against God? And yes, there are. I've chosen just a few for us to think about together this morning. Just briefly, think about Miriam. Miriam, at probably six years old, takes her stand by the Nile to confront the daughter of Pharaoh as she comes down to the Nile and finds her baby brother. Think about how she's acting in defiance to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, whose symbol of royal authority is a snake, who has a snake right on his headdress. You can look it up after chapel, you can Google it. Most pictures of Pharaoh have a snake on his forehead. And Miriam takes her stand, even at a young age, she understands what this man is asking us to do is not right. It's counter to the goodness of God. And therefore, I must oppose it. And so Miriam participates in brokering deliverance for her people. And, and then, after God delivers the people from Egypt, she takes her stand with them by the, by the edge of the Sea of Reeds and celebrates in song God's deliverance, his crushing of his enemy. In, in Exodus 15, it even uses that word crush, that the heads of the enemy have been crushed. Think about Jael. Jael is uh, the paragon of biblical womanhood, isn't she? She literally crushes the head of the one who is opposed to the people of God. She drives a tent peg through his skull. And the way the story is told in Judges chapter four and five, it, we, we get this poetic rendition in chapter five that dramatize it. At, his, at her feet, he sank, he fell, he lay. At her feet. Remember, the seed of the woman would crush the serpent with his feet. Jael brought victory to God's people because she opposed the one who opposed God. Mary, obviously, the mother of Jesus, says yes to God's will, and she bears the ultimate snake crusher. And as we're coming into Holy Week, we're witnessing the, the result of her faithfulness, of her aligning her purposes with God's. Mary Magdalene meets the risen Lord in a garden. And in the garden, like the first woman, she is commissioned to participate in God's work. And she accepts, she runs with the greatest news in human history to tell the rest of the disciples, he's alive. 
And then there's Romans 16, verse 20, which I never noticed before working on this message. Listen to how Paul says it. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. We're not just waiting for the ultimate deliverer, Jesus, who will crush Satan. We get to participate in the crushing of Satan. We get to participate by setting ourselves in opposition to anything that opposes God's goodness and God's rule. So what does it mean for us to exercise wisdom today? We need to recognize our creator as the one who defines good and evil. We need to live faithfully in line with his commission within his parameters. We need to look to him as the source of our provision, saying yes to God and no to sin. We need to see the work that needs to get done and get busy doing it because it's our job as the image of God to participate in this and we need to align our purposes with God's by cultivating hostility against the enemies of God. So here's what I hope you'll take away about Eve. As the mother of all, Eve bears witness to the vital importance of looking to God for wisdom. Because he made us, God alone can tell us who we are and what we were made for. Like Eve, we are God's image appointed to rule over creation. And like Eve, we are meant to be allies, partners in caring for creation. Like Eve, we are to stand in opposition to anything that calls into question God's good intentions for the world. So sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, may we together look to our maker to tell us who we are and to receive wisdom regarding the work he has called us to do in every field, in every area of life, thinking, writing, experimenting, caring for creation, inventing things, teaching, stewarding resources, healing, nurturing the next generation, honoring our parents, counseling others, telling stories, writing songs, preaching, fixing, building, cooking, all of it can be done as allies in the good work that God has created us to do. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.